Uh, I'm super excited about the word today uh, that the Lord has given me. Uh, but I have a few questions that I want to ask, and I want some group participation. I want to see if your arm's working, get that shoulder warmed up, get them elbows going. Uh, if, if this applies to you, I just simply want you to raise your hand. We got that, simple instructions. If these questions, they're a little more serious questions, but if they apply to you, uh, I, I want to know. And I want y'all to look around in the midst of this. So first question is this. Have you ever felt like you didn't fit in? Have you ever felt like you didn't fit in? Okay. Have you ever been rejected before by a person, by a group of people? Okay. Has anybody in here ever been made fun of by somebody? Y'all notice I'm not dropping my hand because I know the next questions. Has anybody in here ever been called weird? Okay. Anybody ever been called a loser before? Okay, and then finally, has anybody ever been called different? Yeah. Yeah. So the dictionary has a word of, for those who have been rejected by society or rejected by a group of people. And if you're not tracking with the back wall yet, that word is outcast. An outcast is someone who's been rejected by society or rejected by a group of people. And if we're being honest with ourselves, nobody really wants to be labeled an outcast. Am I right? Uh, like, no one wants to be called weird. No one wants to be called different. No one wants to be called any of these things. Like, deep down inside of all of us, we have a desire to belong to somebody, to belong somewhere. Like, that's the reason we'll legit get up and move from one place to another. Because if we don't feel like we have connection at a place, we go try to find it somewhere else. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just who we are as humans. But we want to fit in. We want to be a part of of something even better than ourselves. And once again, no one really wants these labels, uh, but today I wanna kind of flip the script and say, what if I told you that being labeled an outcast is actually the best thing that could happen in your life? Yeah. To, to some that might sound foolish, to some that might be foolishness, but can I tell you, God has a way of taking the foolish things of this world and setting people free. And today, I believe that we want to see people set free. My, my prayer has been, as I've been prepping for this message, that I would challenge you. That I would challenge you. Well, not me, but that the word, that God would challenge you today in the way that you think. Um, because I believe that he has something more for all of us. So, open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Very popular story. If you've been in church long, you may have heard this before. If not, you're about to hear an incredible story, uh, an incredible story. But Daniel chapter 3, starting with verse 1, we got a lot to read, so there might be some moments I kind of, um, I summarize a few scriptures and skip. I'll let you know if I do that so you know where we're at. But Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 3. While y'all are still looking, I do want to say this too. I was thinking about it. What's really cool about empowering our students to come up here is this idea. Uh, and Pastor Jeremy, our former DYD, used to say it like this. There's no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. Uh, and I say that because the same Holy Spirit that speaks to myself or speaks to Pastor or Pastor Hope to, to lead us into our messages and to share is the same Holy Spirit that rests inside these youth. Uh, and oftentimes we can get to a point where we see their age and they, we think of them as being less than because they're not mature enough. But can I tell you the same God speaking through them is the same God speaking through us. Uh, and so I say that to encourage you and I let our students know often we have some get up and share testimonies or share devotions on Wednesday night. And I say this because what they have to say is just as important as what I'm about to preach. Uh, because if God opened their eyes to, to that, for them to share with our group, it's the same thing he's doing with me as well. And so I once again, Heidi, thank you for getting up here uh, and sharing your testimony, sharing what God's doing. Uh, once again, I know it takes a lot of strength to do that, but again, what you had to say is just important on the word we're about to preach. So I appreciate you being obedient to what God was telling you to speak as well. So Daniel chapter three, verses one through 27, here we go. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messengers and officials and officers and governors and advisors, my Lord, and every sort of people all throughout the province of Babylon and he to, to bring them to the dedication of the statue in which he has set up. 
So all the officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then the herald shouted, people of all races, nations, languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of these instruments, you are to bow to the ground and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. And anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Were they pretty clear about what's going to happen if you do not worship? Okay, thank you. All right, so at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race, nation, and language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. Oh, you could, mm, you could just already hear it. They thought they were going to get a promotion. Everybody know you got haters always looking for your failure? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You always got people waiting for you to mess up or stand for something when you're not supposed to, and they're the first to go run to the king. So you could hear it. I bet they were like hitting that deep bow and... You know, you just hear it in the voice. Let me try it. They, but they went up, long live the king. You know, they were hamming it up big time. They <laughs> patting themselves on the back. He said, uh, you issued a decree requiring that all the people bow down and worship this gold statue. And when they hear the musical instruments, they are to do so. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into the blazing furnace. And let me just tell you, there's some three Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you've put in charge of the province of Babylon, they pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods, and they do not worship the gold statue in which you have set up. So Nebuchadnezzar flies into a rage. He's, he's angry. Once again, they disobeyed the command in which he has given, so he calls for the boys to come. Bring me Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Maybe there was a misunderstanding along the way. He calls them forward. He says, I love you guys. Y'all a little bit closer to me than some of these others. I'll give you a second chance. I'll give you a second chance. And we pick up in verse 16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. And he will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Man, I want one of them moments where someone comes walking up. Pastor Timothy's always up here talking. Like, I just want to look him up and down be like, nah, fam. Like, I ain't ever worshiping you. Like, I, I would just want one of those moments. But they sit there and they look him in the face in an incredible moment in Scripture. When given the second chance to compromise what they know to be true, they look straight at the king, straight at the very one who made the decree and said, you know what, our God can save us because that's how good he is. But let me just tell you this, even if we die in that furnace, we still refuse to bow to you or worship any of your false gods. There's something different about these three. And I won't read the rest, but as you continue to see, Nebuchadnezzar gets angry, wraps him up, heats the furnace seven times hotter. It's so hot that the folks who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace, they died. They died, and they're in the fire, and Nebuchadnezzar freaks out. He said, how many folks did we throw up in that thing? And they said, three. He said, well, I see four. And the fourth looks like the son of man, and, and, or looks like a god. And so, like, what an incredible moment. He calls out to them. They don't walk out of the furnace. They don't smell like fire. Nothing's burnt on them. And it's just an incredible moment. And Nebuchadnezzar goes on to praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So let us pray today. Lord, I thank you for the day in which you've given. I thank you for this incredible opportunity that we have on this Sunday morning to come together and to worship together, to experience you together. And Lord, in the process, God, I understand that you take over. I know things have looked a little bit different, but God, we're not just for show. Lord, it's an understanding that these students know too because we've gone over it with them this morning. God, we ain't up here to try to look pretty. Lord, we understand that someone's life is going to be changed today by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is why we dance. That is why we shout. That is why we give. That is why we do the things that we do. And so, Lord, as I feel like you've already been working on some of our hearts, this morning. Lord, I pray would you continue to shift our hearts, continue to shift our minds to, to like realize and see what it is that you are speaking. And Holy Spirit, Lord, would you speak through me today that it would be your words that are spoken and not my own. But Lord, I thank you and I praise you and it's in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen. 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 Man. So today, just to kind of lay it out, there's three points from this story that I want to look at. Things that stand out to me. 
Then we're going to look at some practicals about those points. And then we are going to have a moment where you are going to respond. Uh, everybody actually will have a moment to respond. Either you will respond or your lack of response is your response. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, just making sure. Everybody will have a chance to respond here in a little bit. But the first thing, for those taking notes, get them notepads out, those taking notes, first point is this. Standing made them outcast. Standing made them outcast. Once again, the music played, everyone bowed, but there was these three dudes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they decided, nah, fam, like, we standing. We're not going to bow. We're not going to compromise. And in doing this, they automatically made themselves outcasts. They automatically didn't fit in. They automatically stood out. Automatically, like, you got to imagine for yourself, kind of think about the Bible in this way. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego probably had some friends there that day. Would you agree with that? Like, there probably was some other folks. Could you imagine? Like, you down on the ground, you know death's coming, and then you look over and your three buddies are still standing. You don't think folks were going, psst. Shadrach, get out. What are you doing, idiot? Like, like, come on. Come on now. Like, you know, you would be too like, bro, bro this ain't the time. Like, like, I know you all about that Jesus stuff. You all about that God stuff. But like, if there is any time for you to compromise and kneel, like, bro, get down now. I could imagine the, the dudes in the background that didn't like him that went and told on him. I bet they were like, oh, yeah, y'all a bunch of dummies. Like, I hope you keep standing. I can't wait to stand up and go run to the king. And talk. like, you don't imagine that there are people murmuring or saying things around them. Yet what do they do? They continue to stand. They continue to stand. Ultimately, we understand and we know why they stood. Because they believed that there was one true God. Later on, we find out that they believe that he is able to save them from anything that they're going through. This is their conviction. This is what they know to be true. And they refuse to compromise, to bow to some statue or to, fake, to some fake God. And one thing that really stands out, that before the music started, they made up their mind that they were not going to bow. Before they ever walked there, I don't think they just waited into the moment and said, hey, let's get there, and when the music starts playing, then we'll decide if we're going to stand or not. I really feel like they just said, you know what, before we ever step out of this place, I am going to step up, and I am going to continue to stand. I'm going to continue to stand. And once again, it wasn't just in words. They didn't just declare about how good God was and how true God was. They showed it in their action as well. They showed it in their action as well. Without speaking a single word, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told everyone around them what they believed to be true. And, and I put it like this to kind of picture it in my mind. Their silence and standing was louder than any musical instrument that was played that day. Most people probably drowned out the music as they watched these three men stand for what they believed for. What they believed for. These men decided to stand for God. In that moment, they were rejected by those around them. Ultimately, they were rejected by their leadership, and they were slapped on the label of outcasts. But they continued to stand. But they continued to stand. Point number two is this. They stood knowing the cost. They stood knowing the cost. Once again, it wasn't like they were caught off guard. The king, we read it, the king sent out plenty of people to go out and tell everybody uh, what's going to happen. If you do not bow, you will what? All right, let's try that again. If you do not bow, you will die. die. How are you going to die? By what? Furnace. Very clear instructions. It wasn't like when you go to a restaurant and the waiter or waitress comes out with that super hot plate and they hit you with a, hey, don't touch this, it's hot. But for some reason, you think your hands could touch the surface of the sun and you just grab the plate and move it and you're like, oh my God. And like you freak out, like you're surprised. Like you were just told, like, this isn't what they experienced. They were 100% aware of what would happen if they stood. They were 100% aware of the consequences of their standing. I'm pretty sure they knew they'd be the only ones. I'm pretty sure they knew that there would be people who talked about them. I'm pretty sure that there would be, that they knew that there would be a lot of pressure to stay standing when everyone else was kneeling. And I'll tell you this, they knew 100% that they were probably going to end up in a fiery furnace by the end of the day. They, they weren't caught off guard. They were fully aware. And once again, they made up their minds before they ever faced the moment, and they continue to stand. And here's something cool about the standing that we don't think about, too. In the fact that they stood, they decided that they were going to die to themselves. 
See, let me tell you, for them standing, they weren't just dying to the life that they have already lived, but they are dying to the life they had yet to live. These were real men. You, you don't think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't have dreams and aspirations in life? You didn't think they didn't sit around eating dinner at night talking about, my man, you know, one day I might, I might want to open up my own little market spot. Like, I enjoy doing this or that, and I'd love to make these things. Like, I have dreams. You don't think one of them maybe sat back and said, you know, one day I would like to have a wife. I would like to have a family. You, 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 know, you know, maybe they did have a wife. Maybe they did have a family. I don't know those things. But can I tell you, every relationship, every friendship they had, the moment they stood standing, they said that all of those things are dying. Can I tell you that there was no selfishness found in those three men on that day? They understood that, look, it ain't about the material things of this world. It's an understanding that they had seen something, that they had grasped something that is so much greater and so much better than anything else they could ever obtain in this life. It reminds me of Matthew chapter 13. Jesus gives us two quick parables. The first one is about a man who finds a treasure hidden in a field. He goes home, sells everything he has so that he could obtain the field. Then it goes to the next one. It says, a man was going searching for a pearl of great price. And when he finally found the thing in which he was searching for and looking for, that he went home, sold everything he had to purchase the pearl. See, here's the understanding they had. They realized that God is the goal and God is the prize of life. And there's not a material thing in this world that we can have. So when the moment came that music began to play their eyes were so focused on the true goal and the true prize which wasn't it wasn't self it was god and that they were willing to stand that day and give their life they'd seen something greater they had caught hold of the true goal and the true prize of life and the final thing with this point is this because you can't preach this message and not bring up the part but even if he doesn't like you just say that and everybody like oh you know, start hitting and like start shouting, amen. But even if he doesn't, that's the best part to slap on a shirt, do whatever you want. But even if he doesn't, just once again, looking at him, what type of faith is that? Look, my God can save me. I know that to be true. But I'm going to be honest, if he don't do it, and if I get thrown into that fire and I wind up dying, I still refuse to bow. I still refuse to compromise what I know about God to be true, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow. We will not compromise. And point number three is this. They stood together. They stood together. They were not alone. Question, have you ever realized how easy it is to do something when other people are involved? Yeah, I need some group participation one more time. Let's see if them arms are still working, but who in here has ever done something crazy dumb, borderline illegal, or straight up illegal with your friends. Go ahead and raise your hand on that one. Yeah. Hey, students, look for your parents' hands, too, while they're already up. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. I see a lot of, I see a lot of, what, Pastor Hope say, saints in the room with their hands up. Yeah. Have you realized that a lot of those things you probably wouldn't have done by yourself? Some of y'all would have. Y'all really crazy. But, but have you realized that, like, when you're with your friends, you, you begin to do things that you wouldn't normally do? Like, it's just like that, that when there's people around you, it seems to be easier to do certain things. And can I tell you, it made it a lot, I say easier, it was still hard, but it made it a lot easier that Shadrach knew that he had Meshach and Abednego on his right and on his left. If it was just one of the boys, I don't know if they would have done it. If it was just Abednego, I don't know if he, was, if he would do it by himself, if he had enough strength inside of him, if he had enough courage inside of him, if he had enough will inside of him to say, I'm going to stand by myself. But the best part is he didn't have to do it by himself because he had two others with him, that he had two others with them in a very scary moment with the consequences being known, with all the pressure being on these guys, it, when the music started playing and everyone st around them started bowing, when their knees probably started getting a little weak and they, started, they could look to their left and their right and they saw that they had their friends standing there with them. And he says, you know, no, I can stand. Like they encouraged one another and they were there for one another and they had the confidence to stay up. They were not alone. They were not alone. So now I want to take these three points and I want to flip them on how can these things apply to our life? How can these three points apply to our life? Once again, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fact that they stood made them outcasts. Can I say the moment you accepted Jesus Christ into your life and you put your faith and your trust in him and began to follow after Jesus, you made yourself an outcast. Like, I think sometimes we forget in the church that, like, we might be in this world, but we ain't, like, necessarily of it. That he has taken us from this world. That this world is full of darkness and death, and Jesus came to bring light, and he came to bring life into our lives. So, like, we might be here physically, but, like, we are not from this place. Jesus himself even tells us in John 15, 18 through 19, he says, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world, and this is why the world hates you. This is why the world hates you. The fact that you claim Jesus as your Savior, the, lo- the world hates you. Uh, but the issue becomes we're so more concerned about finding acceptance in the eyes of the world than we are in Christ. Like we spend more time and attention on getting the world to accept us and to love us than we spend that time on growing closer in our relationship with God. We talk the talk all day long, but when the music plays, we find ourselves compromising with knees on the ground, wanting to look more like the normal ones bowing than the outcasts standing. Like we need to understand, we were not meant, the only person I'm bound for is Jesus. That's the only one. But in this world, my knee bows to no one. And I'm an outcast. I'm different. And I thought about this. The world hates us, but we try so hard to be like the world. Y'all know that friend that was in that relationship with that girl, that girl that was in that relationship with the boy? Like, they didn't even like him, but your friend was so head over heels for him. And they tried everything to get these people to like them or get these people to love them. And they shunned everybody else off in the family and then the friend group. And ultimately, they still never fell in love in the end. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay. Like, that's what we look like with the world. We striving after the world. We trying to look more like Satan than we do Jesus Christ. And like, we're striving after that. Can I tell you, he's never going to love you? Can I tell you the world was, is never going to accept you as long as Jesus Christ's blood has covered your sins and covered your life? Like this world will never love you. This world will never accept you. And so we in our hearts, we need to have the conviction that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had that says, look, come what may, I will not bow. I will not bow. Once again, the second point. They stood knowing the cost. They, once again, they knew the consequences. They knew what would happen if they stood. And can I tell y'all, we know, just like they knew the pressures they were about to walk into. Like, to be honest, most of us have kind of the same routine daily if it's going to work or going to school. Every once in a while, things kind of get disrupted. But for the most part, you know the pressures you're going to face walking into your place of business or walking into your school. You know the moments in your life where you might feel pressured to compromise what you know about God. And like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we need to decide before we ever walk into that place what we are going to do. What we are going to do. See, the thing is, we often, we wait till we get in the situation. We wait until we get into the moment before we actually decide if I'm going to stand for God today or not. You know, because I might walk into the moment and I don't want to compromise, but uh, my, my friend group might be doing something that I really like to do. So maybe today I might bow, but then like tomorrow, if I don't feel like it, then I'll stand. Yeah. See, the thing is, you are going to lose every battle that you are not prepared for. And so you need to wake up daily. You need to spend time with the Lord before you ever leave your house and decide that, Lord, today I will not compromise. Today I am going to stand. The pressures may come. These things may come against me, but I will not bow to the things of this world. Because if you ain't prepping, you're going to fail every time. Because if you're not prepping, you're going to fail every time. And I want to shout out because, like, you need to speak scripture over your life. 
if there's something, if there's a pressure that's a little bit harder or a temptation that's a little bit harder than another, then you need to crack open the word of God. You need to find scripture that you can stand on so that when you walk into that moment, you can continue to quote it. That when you wake up in the mor morning, you can continue to quote it and declare, this is what I am going to do. This is who the word of God declares that I am. And I have my convictions held that God is who he says he is. That God's word is faithful and true. And if you want to know how to fight spiritual warfare a little bit better, you can go check out Not Today Satan on YouTube. Pastor just took a whole like four weeks to talk about it. We expose the things of the enemy so that you can fight. So that you can fight. And before on our missions trip, as I was worshiping down front, the Lord just put something heavy on my heart that I got to put in the message today. And it's simply this, those in the church need to learn to die to themselves again. I mean, I don't have to really say this. We all kind of know it, but we live in a very selfish culture and a very selfish world that it's all about us. Like if we don't like it, we can just get rid of it and get something new. Like I even heard on a, a commercial on the radio, they talked about having to hold on, you, you sign up, you get your phone and you're in a three-year contract. And one of the comments was, uh, I can't even stay in a relationship that long. And I was like, well, that ain't good. <laughs> and talking about you should get a two-year contract. And I'm just like, bro, our camera, like the next upgradable phone ain't even that great, but we're so quick to have the new thing because once again, it's selfish. It's all about what I want, what I need. If I want a better phone, I'll go get it. Can I tell you, I ain't even had my car that long. The dealership already calling me back saying, we'll buy it and sell you a new one. And I'm like... I still like my old one. Like, we still rolling. We almost paid off. Like, I'm good. I'm good. But once again, if we're, if we're not paying attention and seeing the things as we ought to, we'll say, you know what? You know, I do need a new car. And what we don't realize is, like, yeah, I am getting in more debt. Yeah, more of my money is being held down so I can't give to the kingdom. Yeah, those things are caught up so I can't begin to bless others to send them on mission trip or to bless the food distribution that's going on at my church. See, it's so much more than just selfishness blocks a lot of things in your life. It blocks the blessing God has ready for you when you pour out those things to others. Selfishness is like that. You don't like the way you look? Cut your hair, buy you some new clothes that you don't actually need because you got a whole closet of stuff you don't wear anyway. Anybody like that? I mean, that, I ain't going to lie. I got like a million shirts, wear three of them, just rotate them. You can ask my wife. You can ask the staff. It's like, oh, Jack, it's your Tuesday outfit. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and then we get to Friday. It's like, didn't you wear that Tuesday? I'm like, I watched it, so we're good. <laughs> but like, once again, it's all about how can I get something new? Because if this thing ain't, if it ain't meeting my needs, I don't need it. Man, we joked about the relationship thing. Some of us jump from relationship to relationship to relationship because we're just looking for something to meet our needs. And can I tell you, we even run through the mind, well, there ain't a ring on her finger. There ain't a ring on his finger. So there's really no full commitment to this. So like if I need to back out, I can back out and go find somebody else that I actually meet the needs that I have. Uh, we might even go a step further and say that about our spouses as well. Once again, we live in a culture where it's all about you. And if you don't like it, go get something new. But can I tell you something about the new thing? It'll never, it'll never satisfy the impossible bar that is your expectations. And can I tell you that when you live in selfishness, you will never be satisfied. Why do you think we got rich people? are people who have these huge families and all these things, and yet they're the ones who seem to be most depressed. They're the ones still running after drugs. They're the ones committing suicide because it shows that just because you have a lot of material things, those might be selfishly for some, but like that doesn't fulfill you. And can I tell you, it's when we are unselfish that when we are willing to grasp the understanding of what Jesus is trying to teach us, that true fulfillment can come into our lives. And I did want to speak this. I don't know who it's for, but I felt this on my heart heavy last night. And I just want to say you've lost, you've lost sight of the true goal and the true prize of life. Where people once looked to you and saw what it meant to be selfless. Where you were once one who truly loved the things and the heart of God. You've now become the very person over time that you declared you would never be. You've lost sight. And just like Matthew chapter 13, I want to draw your attention back to that. These two men saw 
something that was worth giving it all. And can I just remind you that Jesus is the one who is worth giving it all. He is the one. He's the one that's worth giving everything. And it's time to remember again that he is the goal and that he is the prize of life. Again, he is the one worth losing our life for. Worth losing our life for. And before I close point two, but even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, question, what if we read this story and God never saved Shadrach, ooh, Meshach, and Abednego? What if at the, at the end of it, homies step in front of the king and say, look, our God can save us, but even if he doesn't, we ain't bowing. But then the story goes on that they're thrown in the fire and all three men die. Would we still read this story and celebrate the faithfulness of these three men? Or would we stand back and point fingers at God saying, man, why didn't you do something? Our little church answer says, no, we would still celebrate the faithfulness. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Are we taking another offering today? Let me, no. Let's be honest. How many times have we prayed for God to do things, and when he doesn't do it, we sit back and point fingers at him as a failure? And, and that's not to shame anybody. But I say it like this so I can say we need some folks in the church that are willing to say, but even if he doesn't do what I'm asking for, what I'm praying for, it ain't going to change the way in which I believe and know about my God. Can, can I be honest? There's some people that I'm praying for. I got some family members going through some things, and I'm believing and speaking faith and speaking healing. But can I tell you, if God doesn't heal them like I think he should, even if he doesn't, I'm still not compromising what I know to be true about God. That you might find yourself in a moment where you're saying, Lord, I'm praying for my family to be reconciled. That there's some things happening, there's some things going on, but Lord, can I tell you that even if you don't do it like I think you're going to do it, my knee will never hit that ground and my knee will never bow. That like, I understand, I'm about to walk through hell itself, going through some difficult moments, and Lord, I'm praying and I'm asking for some protection along the way, but can I tell you, even if it doesn't, even if you don't, I will never turn my back on you because my praise isn't dependent upon he saving me from the flames. My praise is just the fact that he is enough. Come on. I don't want no circumstantial relationship with the Lord that when he's doing good, oh, Jesus, I love you. No, I want that relationship that knows what it's like to be on top of the mountaintop, but also knows what it's like to be in the valley. See, we don't like difficult times. We don't like hard times. But if we would all truly reflect for a moment and look back at our own lives, we'd realize that the greatest lessons and the greatest moments in our life were ever learned in the valley. And if I'm just waiting for the moment mountaintops with God, I ain't fully realizing everything he has for me. That some days I got to walk through moments where he's like, okay, go ahead. And I got to walk through some difficult moments. But can I tell you, even on the back end, even if he didn't protect me like I thought he would, he's still there to pick me up and I can look back and go, man, you were faithful for me the entire time. Come on, keep your little circumstantial relationship. I don't want it. I don't want it. My praise is not dependent upon what he can do for me. My praise and my faith in him is simply dependent on that he is enough. That he is enough. Point number three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood together. Stood together. They weren't alone. You know what that tells me? That we need community. We need community. We need people around us. And can I tell y'all, community brings accountability. Accountability brings vulnerability. And vulnerability leads to your freedom. Accountability, sorry, community brings accountability. Accountability brings vulnerability, and vulnerability leads to your freedom, leads to your freedom. And this is where the issue is. 
We want the community without the accountability. So what we do is we go out and we surround folks as our community with folks who don't go to church with us, folks who don't serve with us, folks who don't read the Bible and study the Bible with us. These are the folks that we surround ourselves because we don't want to be held accountable for the fact that we ain't touched our Bible in three years, that we don't want people to hold us accountable to the fact that we ain't serving nowhere in church. We don't want people to hold us accountable to the fact that we only open the church doors a couple times a year. Like we stay away from that. But then we're shocked when the music begins to play and our knees are falling and compromised to the things of God. See, you might have people around you, but you keep compromising because the people you're surrounding yourself do not have the same convictions as you. Let me go a step further. Shadrach, Meshach. What if Abednego really didn't love God like that? What if Abednego really didn't have the, uh, the conviction that the boys did? He loved Jesus, don't get me wrong, hallelujah. But when it came to giving my life, like that's where I draw the line. Could you imagine in that moment Shadrach and Meshach are standing there, they feel the pressure of everyone around them bowing, and they go to look at their third friend on the end to get some encouragement that we can do this, and my boy on the ground kneeling like everybody else? But spiritually, that's where we at. We have, we have our bros behind us. We have our folks behind us, our ladies behind us. But at the same time, they're collapsing. We ain't got people that have the same convictions as we do that no matter what happens, I'm going to continue to stand. I'm going to continue to stand. It's not enough for you to have people around you. Once again, you need a community that has the same convictions about God that you do. So when the music plays and the pressures turn up, you can look at them and they will still be standing. And they will still be standing. Can I tell you, we say it often here at the church, but you can find community here at Journey Church in your journey groups. But let me go a step further. Community is not found in an hour and a half on a Wednesday night or Sunday morning. Like community is found when y'all go and have dinner together on a random night. Community's found when y'all show up at each other's birthday parties and hang out. Like, it's part of the group. Community's like when you just randomly got a free night and go, yo, you want to go putt-putt? Sure, bring the kids, and y'all go. Community looks like, like going to a discipleship class and pushing yourself a little bit further than just the teaching you get on a Sunday morning so that you can grow together so you can help grow the kingdom together. Like community looks like being the ones that call up saying, yo, I'm going through a difficult time right now. I'm struggling. I feel the pressure. I feel the music. My knee's getting weak. I feel like bowing. And they can look at you and say, no, no, no. And they can start encouraging you. They can start speaking life into you, declaring the word of God into your life. Community ain't an hour and 30 minutes. Community is your life. Community is your life. And that is the passion and that is the desire from Pastor Timothy and Pastor Hope. I'm thankful for our journey groups. And those are moments where we can meet and it's scheduled that you can. But can I tell you, our journey groups, that community is supposed to go far beyond the walls of this church. That community needs to take place inside of your homes. Like that's where true community begins to build. That's where true community is. I'm thankful that we can open up this church on Sundays and Wednesdays for you to have your time. But can I tell you, you need more than just that. And you're, you find community and journey groups as you push yourselves more. Worship team, if y'all come on. I got one last thing. And then we'll jump straight into it. Again, no one wants to be labeled an outcast. No one wants to feel like they stand out. No one wants to feel different. No one wants to feel like they don't fit in. Again, we all want community. We, we all want a group of people who are willing to love us and a group of people who are willing to accept us. But can I tell you something? If the label of outcast is being placed on me because I'm willing to stand and not compromise when those around me begin to bow, if they're wanting to label me outcast, because I make up my mind before I ever walk into situations that I spend time with God in the morning and speak life over myself and speak the power of the word over myself. If I'm willing, if they're going to label me outcast because I've come to this understanding that I am dying to myself, 
I'm dying to my dreams. I'm dying to my selfish ambitions because I understand that Jesus has given me new dreams. And where my old sinful ones, my old selfish ones were to build myself these new dreams that God has given me is to build the kingdom. If I'm being labeled outcast because I'm willing to say even if he doesn't, that even in the midst when my prayer requests aren't answered, that I'm still stomping around with joy, lifting my hands in worship, praising and speaking about a God who's greater than anything else. If I'm being labeled outcast because I've got a group of friends that are willing to stand with me when everyone else bows, then you best believe you can slap that label straight on my chest. If that's what it means to be an outcast, then you can call me an outcast every day of my life. Because I have tasted and I have seen and I know deep down inside of myself that there is no one greater than him. That he is that treasure hidden in the field. He is that pearl of great price. He is the goal and he is the prize of life. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand. Here in a second, I'm going to give everyone a chance to respond. And there's only two things. You can either say yes or you can say no. There's no in-between. There's no maybe. I say this every time I get a chance to preach, especially on Sunday mornings. This moment is incredible. This moment is great. But if you go home and change nothing, this moment was for nothing. One area I skipped in my notes that I'm remembering in this moment, I I recall to your memory, they had to stand up twice. The first time was hard enough. Second time they were brought before the king himself. See, I feel like sometimes we we have to stand up inside this church and we encourage y'all to come because you're making a declaration. Can I tell you this moment's hard? Can I tell you when you're willing to stand around those around you and say, you know what, that my life is one that needs to change, that I'm a sinner in need of a savior? You know it's really hard to stand up in those moments, but this ain't the only moment. There's gonna be other times. What happens when you go in front of that coworker or your friend? And the moment comes where the pressure comes and you got to stand up again. And this time it ain't at a church altar, but it's in front of people you associate with. And I want to encourage you, don't walk out of this place and be the same person. Don't walk out of this place and be the same person. So with every head bowed and every eye closed. how madly in love the Lord is with you. I hope you realize just how much your Father cares for you. If you were ever presented a God that's angry and that, man, I just said yes to Jesus to get out of hell because it scared me, can I tell you that ain't who God is? I didn't accept Jesus to save me from hell. I accepted Jesus because I saw how good he was. That I saw that he was faithful and that he was true. That he loves me. That he cares for me. That his grace and his mercy abounds. Some of y'all might need to change the script of how you even view God. 
he ain't the man in the suit yelling and spitting about sinners going to hell. Though, yes, hell is a real place. Yes, that is what eternity looks like for those who don't know him. But can I tell you?